I saw a study last week that had researchers asking participants to rate emotional and physical pain of a breakup. They found that women tend to be more negatively affected by breakups, reporting high levels of both physical and emotional pain. But while breakups hit women the hardest, they tended to recover more fully. Men, on the other hand, rarely fully recovered. I thought that was very interesting. I wasn't too sure what that meant. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, it also rings true with my, my experience and my observations. It, I, I think, I mean, this could relate to a number of things. And here I'm painting with a broad brush, right? But, um, you know, how comfortable one is feeling their feelings, is male or female, is going to strongly dictate how quickly one moves through grief. This is the same thing as trauma. The more willing someone is to feel the full depth and intensity of the feelings that they associate with that trauma, the more quickly they're going to move through the trauma. Uh, again, I'm lifting from Paul Conti's words, so these aren't mine, but you know, people use a number of strategies. They use distraction. They use states like, uh, they sublimate to things like anger um, and avoidance of various kinds in order to not feel the traumatic feelings or not feel the breakup. People will you know, uh, try and self-soothe with alcohol or try and self-soothe with multiple new partners or whatever it happens to be. It doesn't work just extends it because this map of space, time, and closeness needs to be fractured. And the only way to do that is for the brain to have to confront the reality, which is that whether by death or by, by breakup, they are no longer available. It's like the food on the other side of that wall is gone. It's just not there anymore. Uh, or that the food that was accessible, now there's a wall in between and you will not get through it. And you know, you can see this actually in animal studies that are kind of hard they're actually very hard to watch you'll see the animal perseverate literally damage its own body trying to get through a barrier to something it's highly motivated to see people do that post breakup they usually do that by talking to everybody about the breakup um which is its own form of perseverating on the motivation what did i do what did i do wrong this and that and some of that analysis is healthy some of it's not now why would one group be more uh, let's just say effective at dealing with breakups. It's probably the ability to really feel the full intensity of how sad it is and be able to confront that. And here I'm, you know, I'm a male. I've only ever lived in a male body. So all I can tell you is that I think from a very early age, um, there's a, an ability that at least I'm sure it transcends to women too, um, or extends to women too, but learning to pack down feelings, right? And so when are we really talking about when we're talking about pack down feelings? I'm not a psychologist, but what we learn is top down control, forebrain to autonomic control. It's the same thing like, I don't want to jump off the high dive, or I don't want to do this public speaking, but I'm going to, I'm going to kind of like, I'm just going to force myself. I'm going to David Goggins it, right? Grief is, a, is an autonomic state. Uh, we say it has valence, it has negative valence. But it's high levels of autonomic arousal with a negative connotation because you can be high levels of autonomic arousal with happiness, right? You can be very alert and aroused and happy, very alert and aroused and sad. It's very alert and aroused and sad. And yet we learn how to tamp that down. What is tamping down? It's reducing our heart rate. It's going to work each day, being a functional human being. You know, there's a lot of that rather than allowing ourselves to, you know, sob uncontrollably into a pillow. Um, some people are better at this. I mean, the late Steve Jobs was a big proponent of scream therapies. He used to go up into the hills behind Stanford. He actually owns some, still owns a property back there. He was really into, ah, you know, catharsis, cathartic release of internal state that he felt would allow him to like return as a happier, nicer person. He was also kind of well-known for screaming at people in the office. So he obviously had a lot pent up inside. Um, so I think the better that we can lean into the emotional states that we fear the most, but in a controlled way where we're not harming ourselves or other people, the better. The more that we try and avoid that and we try and sublimate or just, you know, and I've done this, so I'm speaking from experience, you know, I would use the anger or the sadness from an experience to just work 10, 10 times longer, 10 times harder to just get that much more focus. You're taking that autonomic arousal, that narrow aperture and that energy, and you're putting it onto something that moves your life forward. So in some cases that's good because you still need to function, and it give, but it can give you the, here I'll just say, it, it gave me the illusion that I was working through something because you get all the accoutrements and rewards of hard work, but what you don't do is remap that space-time closeness map. And then you find, I guarantee, you find yourself five or 10 years later wondering why you're so exhausted or why certain things in life aren't going well. And it's because when they say you haven't dealt with the loss, 
you never actually allowed yourself to feel the feelings. But once you do, it's like a valve, it releases. You hear musicians say that the most recent album was shit because I didn't have any heartbreak to work right. through. Right. And it, it is strange how people, it, it's a difficult thing to pass because a little bit of it is kind of like alchemy, right? A little bit of it is kind of like turning something that's terrible into something that's useful and beautiful. It's fuel. But you're right, it, it is a, it's a, a hiding away from what it is that you actually need to do, from the work that you need to do. And in a world which is a meritocracy where people want success and status and accolade and fame, and you go, well, enemies and revenge and bitterness, resentment, pretty good motivators. Maybe yeah. I could use some of that. Yeah. Maybe I should go out of my way to try and put myself into positions where this motivates me. And working out where that falls on the ledger is, is a difficult one. It is. And I think uh, it depends on life stage and it depends on how one is going to work it out. I mean, the, the narrative around the shark dive, I mean, even as I say it now, several, that was 2017 was the second dive. When I think about all that, I think like, that was crazy. I was out there studying fear and I almost was the professor who died studying fear. It would have been a terrible <laughs> end to the story. Um, what was I doing? Don't do this. Don't do this. But, you know, there are times in our life where we feel compelled to take on certain challenges for whatever reason. I, there's a phrase that doesn't exist in the scientific literature, but it captures two um, components of physiology that are absolutely factual. Earlier, we talked about limbic friction. Um, as it relates to creative process and sublimation of anger and sadness and creating things from bad events, books, music, etc., cetera, um, the, the words that come to mind are li limbic resonance. The human beings resonate with these extreme states. You know, there aren't many great albums written about a good day walking on a Sunday in the park. Like, it's kind of boring. I mean, there's the, the beautiful painting Sunday in the park with George, but and I'll be honest, it's beautiful, but it's also kind of boring. You can look at the details of it for a while. People like intensity. The scream is, you know, people can look at that for a long time and it speaks to the psychosis of the artist, et cetera. You know, people don't generally bond through passive, relaxed states unless they've also been through a lot together. <laughs> Right. I mean, you even think about uh, the we could talk about this separately if you want, but all of us are here because of the autonomic seesawing that is the reproductive act. It goes from highly aroused. Is that how you refer to it in your lab? Yeah, you know, scientists. Autonomic after. seesawing. It is. It's very interesting that the arousal process is one of increase in autonomic arousal in order to get true arousal, but then not so much that it inhibits arousal then mating behavior, and then the, the orgasm response in males and females is highly what we call sympathetic, not emotionally sympathetic. It can be, I suppose, emotionally sympathetic, but from a pure physiology standpoint, it's a activation, hyperactivation of the stress system, even though it has positive valence. And then there's a very quick rebound to the so-called parasympathetic arm of the autonomic nervous system, this deep relaxation, which we don't really know why I wasn't consulted at the design phase, but we think that that post-coital bliss and, is, and the kind of relaxing, the desire to not run around a bunch more for most people, was to exchange odorant molecules to increase pair bonding. And even if people aren't trying to pair bond, because people don't always just mate to reproduce, but that uh, some of the molecules that are released in each of the two individuals, oxytocin being the main one, give people a sense of kind of postcoital bliss and and it's a very calm one that creates opportunity for bonding and discussion that is all like pillow talk there are other forms of pillow Called talk post too post nut clarity andrew <laughs> well, but for women it might be something different right of course a different different name i only speak in the language of physiology but for both men and women this happens it creates this little orb of closeness that is both physiological and but neurochemical too so what we can say for sure is that whether or not it was in vivo or in a dish, we are all here because two parents, right? A male and a female, unless you're a condor where two females can produce a baby, this has now been shown, right? But as far as we know, where a male and a female reproduce because they each went through this arc of arousal, not too high, arousal, extreme stress, relaxation. That happened separately or together because in vitro it could be, uh, fertilization could be separate. So the test of whether or not we get to reproduce is actually the ability to, to assuming that people are doing this uh, together and not through uh, in vitro fertilization, is a test of whether or not people can coordinate their autonomic nervous systems. Now there are ways around that and to override it, but by and large, that's the way humans evolved and the way all other animals evolved. What's happening, people? If you enjoyed that, then press here 
for the full, unedited episode. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.